When you think about hope, I mean, our ultimate hope is what? Is, of course, in Jesus Christ, right? Um, but you can also, you know, you can find hope in God's word, you know, um, his written word. I think there's a connection between the two, between Jesus and the word too, because in John 1, 1, it says Jesus is the word, right? It says in the beginning was the word, the word was, was God, and the word was with God. And then John 1, 14, it says, and the word became flesh, which is probably the shortest gospel version of the Christmas story you're going to find. <laughs> so, but... Um, yeah, then you also have, so you have the written word, but, um, and which, you know, is very comforting sometimes when you need to look at God's promises and, and, and see what that has to say. And that can, of course, bring hope. But there also is um, the rhema word. I don't know if you guys are as familiar with that. Um, this, this, the written word would be logos. The rhema word is the spoken word of God. And, um, and that also can be used for great encouragement and also for, um, for bringing hope. So I want to um, actually talk about that this morning a little bit. The rhema word can cover a variety of different things. I might actually interchange the word rhema with prophetic sometimes, but actually it can cover a little bit more than that. You know, sometimes it could be a specific word that the Holy Spirit brings from the Bible to you. It could be, um, it could come in the form of a dream, a vision, uh, angel visitation. Um, as you look in the Old Testament, you know, you see different people who will actually, you know, obviously we have the prophets, right? We have major and minor prophets. And in Joel, one of the minor prophets, he actually, I'm going to share a very common verse that, uh, or a lot of, a kind of a famous verse a lot of people know, Joel 2, 28. And it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and young men shall see visions. And this verse was actually quoted by Peter when people are like, what in the world is going on when, around Pentecost, right? And, and he says, this is that. This is that which was prophesied back in Joel 2.28. Um, and it's interesting because if you look at when the New Testament opens up, there's just like this explosion almost of dreams and visions and, and angelic visitations and even prophetic ministry. And this is after about 400 years of just total silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I couldn't imagine being in that 400 years of silence. That would be so frustrating to be like, okay, God, where are you? You know, I've, we haven't heard from you in a long time. But then, you know, right around that time where Jesus is born and the New Testament starts, there's just like just this explosion of it. And um, we see John the Baptist, who also, uh, the latest um, of the prophets probably in the Old Covenant, come on the scene. He's the forerunner for Jesus, and he's prophesying and declaring the kingdom of God is at hand. And then his parents were prophesied, too, about his birth by Gabriel. And then you have Mary and Joseph and the shepherds. Um, you know, they're getting angelic visitations and dreams. And you have Anna and Simeon come on, and they're prophesying over the baby Jesus. And I find it interesting and educational to just look at all of these events. And... Um, Look at the different way that different ways that people react um, to these different words that they're getting, and the impact that those words actually had on them. <clears throat> so that's kind of what I felt would be uh, the Lord put on my heart was to, sh to talk about how do we steward the rhema word of God, um, the spoken word of God, as opposed to the logos, as the written word of God, because um, like I said, it can come in a lot of different forms. It can come from you know I'm sure some. Of you have received prophetic words, someone speaking over you, or, you know, maybe you've had a dream or, you know, a vision, and rare occasions people are even getting angelic visitations still. But these messages are usually to us specifically for a specific reason, or it could be for groups of people of different sizes. Sometimes this is warnings, and sometimes it's a, a word of encouragement to you, and sometimes it can be something to help give you some direction in your life. And that is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 and 3, he says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Because he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort, comfort to men. So what does that mean? Edification is just a, a fancy word for instruction or guidance. Exhortation, another one of those fancy words. This is really what, it's just kind of like encouraging, um, kind of urging sometimes to do something. And comfort, of course, is just uh, self-explanatory. It's, you know, sometimes it's hope that we need to hear in the middle of a hopeless situation. Amen. So as we're approaching the Christmas season, 
I thought it would be kind of helpful and, and actually kind of fun to just look at some of the rhema or prophetic events that went on around the time of the birth of Jesus. So going to Damien's suggestion, because we talked about um, maybe Zacharias and Elizabeth when we talk about hope, um, would be a good place to start. So the Gospel of Luke starts with their story. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Elizabeth was barren, and both Zacharias, her husband, um, and Elizabeth were well advanced in years. It's kind of a polite way of saying they're old. <laughs> you know, well advanced in years, years, which means they're at the point in, in which they really show they, they should no longer have any hope for having children. You know, it's kind of like, you, I guess you reach that point at some point. But um, in verse 6, it also says, I'm going to back up a verse. It says that they were both righteous before God. And I'm not going to go through their whole story. But I want to pause for a second there. Because much too often, I think I've seen the enemy where he lies to people about why they, see, they don't see certain things happen in their lives. Right? I mean, how, many, how often have you heard people say, oh man, the Lord must be teaching me a lesson. Or if, you know, maybe I did something wrong and the Lord's punishing me or I should have done this or I shouldn't have done this. But, you know, how many of you know that sometimes it's just the fact that we live in a fallen world, you know? This, this earth doesn't reflect God's will, which is why Jesus actually in his model prayer to the disciples says, Lord, your will be done in heaven. Or, I'm sorry, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven, that's what's reflective of God's will, where there is no pain, no suffering, no... I mean, everything's just going the way that God's will would like to go. Um, but sometimes, in fact, oftentimes, prayer changes things. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And so there was a day where Zacharias, and he was part of the tribe of Levi, he was a priest, was going into the temple to fulfill his responsibility, and the angel Gabriel shows up. I'm going to look at a couple of verses in Luke chapter 1 again. Uh, 12 and 13, and when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. And I could, I could totally relate to this because I get startled easy. I get startled by Risa walking by me sometimes when I'm not expecting I'm in the bathroom or something. So, but I can imagine like if an angel shows up and you see this over and over in the Gospels, an angel shows up and he says, and he, the first thing they have to say is don't be afraid because it scares them. And so the angel says, don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard and Elizabeth, your wife, will bear you a son, and you should call his name John. Now, based on how I see this story go, I think they probably stopped praying a long time ago. Because, um, you know, too often, I think that we can be guilty of that, though, right? We can be guilty of praying for things for a certain period of time, and then we just kind of just give up, you know, praying for things that, when it gets to the point where it really takes a miracle, we're like, well... Subconsciously, we probably think, oh, well, this isn't going to happen. This is too big. Right? You know, once we reach that stage, we get to, it's too easy to get discouraged and just give up. But the point of prayer should be that we're asking God to do something. So why stop when it requires a miracle, right? Because we're pulling God into it. Amen. We're getting God involved when we pray. So we need to stop thinking that natural way. You know, I've even had somebody where I... Um, one time I was getting uh, my teeth cleaned and the dental assistant was talking about, you know, going to get rotator cuff surgery. And I'm like, hey, what, I could pray for that. And she said, well, it doesn't make sense to pray now. Why don't you pray after the surgery? And because, you know, it's just like, it, it's just reflective of how often we think. Like, we're, God is just going to help what's going to happen naturally anyways. You know what I mean? That's what some people are thinking. But no, the reality is we have to get back to thinking, no, God is still the God of miracles. Amen. <laughs> so... Many times God has purpose in his timing too. And uh, in this case, we see this because their son was supposed to be a forerunner of Jesus. So it was just at their perfect time. Because, see, Elizabeth and, and um, Zacharias were a lot older than Mary and Joseph. And so they had to be around the same time they were going to have birth. And so in, in going further on in Luke chapter 1, it says, And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. This is what Gabriel is telling Zacharias still. And he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor straw drink, strong drink, and he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. How cool is that? And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient uh, to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. 
But unfortunately, like I was saying, sometimes you can lose hope and it starts to get into your heart. And a hopeless heart can lead to some dangerous words. You know, Jesus even talked about that. You know, be careful what comes out of your mouth because what comes out of your mouth reflects your heart. And what did, how did Zacharias respond to all this? After getting this amazing word from the angel Gabriel, he said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man. Don't you understand? I am really old. <laughs> and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answers him and says, I am Gabriel. <laughs> um, I'm not some run-of-the-mill angel. You know, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God who has been sent to you and bring you these glad tidings. And behold, you will be mute and will not be able to speak until the days of these will take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in your own time. Because unfortunately, see, he had lost hope to the point where he couldn't even accept the miracle when it was told him it was coming. <clears throat> and as a result, what happened? He was made mute. Why was he made mute? That's kind of an interesting question. Like, why? Why did he choose? Because, see, there's power in our words. There's power in our words. And because our mouth proceeds the words from our heart and our words have power, that disbelief um, Gabriel, Gabriel said, I'm not going to have you mess up this thing I just said. I'm not going to have you speaking disbelief out because of, on your tongue. That is so good. Sometimes we need to humbly receive the word when the Lord is saying something. Because we've got to remember, God gives out grace. It's not something we earn. Because so often we can think when we get a really big word, I just, that's just hard to receive. I mean, that's just... You know, maybe that was for somebody else. But see, it's, it's all by God's grace. You can't, it's not about you, right? And sometimes, you know, like I said, those words can be hard to believe. But see, it's all about God. It's what God wants to do through you. It's not about you. You know, I've talked to others about, you know, words that they may have experienced that they've gotten. And they're like, you know, I've gotten some too at times where it's just like, seriously? Is this, that's hard to believe. But you got to remember that. It's what God wants to do through us. And he just, you know, it was like his grace. He'll, he'll choose any of us. He's, he's the most unlikely candidate is the one he'll a lot of times choose. So I, I qualify for that. <laughs> um, Mary was probably given one of the hardest words, I believe, to receive. Um, and let's look at that now. In, in Luke chapter 1, going further in verse 26 through 29, it says, Now in the sixth month, the sixth month is now referring to how far along Elizabeth was, who some people claim was maybe her cousin, but they were related. We don't know exactly how, no how. But in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was now sent by God to a city of Galilee called, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, to the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, to the, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at this saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. I mean, I, I would have just been wrecked by that greeting alone. I mean, <laughs> just think about that. I mean, you know, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you. Of course, you know, a man, but blessed are you among women, right? I just put myself in Mary's place. You know, that alone would have just been right. I mean, that kind of gives the saying, you had me at hello, a whole new, <laughs> whole new meaning. It's like, but then he drops the real big bomb. The angel of the Lord um, said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great. And he will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And his throne. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom um, there will have no end. Wow. Now if, if that were me, once again I put myself in that place. I sheepishly would have said, can you say that again? Because that's just a lot to take in. I mean it was like, Wow. Anyway, it's, let's look at Mary's response to this. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? You know, she's a virgin, of course. Now, the difference between Mary asking this question as opposed to Zachariah's question is hers is not one of unbelief. She just wants to know, like, I don't, how is this going to be? I mean, I'm a, I'm a virgin. 
Um, she's just curious about it. And so the angel responds and says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age and is now in her sixth month for her um, who, was, who was barren. For with God, nothing is impossible. That's what Gabriel goes back to say again. So here we got two impossible situations. You've got somebody who's way beyond their age getting a baby. You have another one who's, who's a virgin getting, her, getting a baby. And Mary said, Behold, your maidservant of the Lord, let it be done <coughs> according to your word. And the angel departed her. Wow, what a, what a great way to just receive that word. So now what? Now Mary's in a tough situation. She's betrothed to, to Joseph, but they're not married yet. So now she needs to break the news to Joseph, right? Which would be a bit hard for him to accept. You could imagine. I mean, um, the morning that Damien actually called me, I was actually reading this passage in Matthew. And I was dwelling um, on Joseph's situation. And like, if I had heard that, like, putting myself in his place, I'd be so confused because obviously Mary is somebody who is super special. I mean, she caught God's eye, right? So she, in, I mean, Joseph had to see, like, she's an amazing woman also, right? I mean, but then he'd be thinking, where, where did I go wrong with the way I saw her maybe? Like, you know, um, I can't, I, I mean, he had to be shocked, right? Where, how could I get this wrong? How did I, how did I miss this? And, um, and in those days, when you're betrothed, it's like you were engaged, but you, you were committed to be married, but you weren't married yet. But in those days, you were, there was a commitment to such to the level that you would have to be divorced to be separated. You couldn't just break it off. Um, so let's look at Matthew for a, a minute here, and um, we'll pick up in verse 18. And it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they had come together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to put her, um, make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins." So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to, his wife, took to him his wife, and did not know her till they had brought forth her first son, and they named him Jesus." This passage, this verse, to me, is the epitome of the power of the rhema word. Why? Because you look at Joseph's situation. He went from being discouraged, I'm sure even maybe depressed, confused, overwhelmed with the situation in a bad way, right? Like, just laying there probably awake almost. Well, it did say, like, the angel appeared to him in a dream, but he was thinking about it. And... Um, all of a sudden, this, this, trans, this, this word from the Lord that came to him transformed all of that emotion to one that's probably just excited, overwhelmed now in a good way, um, just blown away through the whole thing, right? Just totally transforms his way of thinking. That's the power of the, of the prophetic, this power of the rhema word. And um, so he went from thinking Mary is some kind of unfaithful liar, perhaps, to now the virgin prophesied in Isaiah, going to carry the Savior, the Messiah. You know, I'm not sure he made the point right away um, with the connection in I Isaiah because it doesn't actually say that the angel, angel said that. But I'm sure at some point he had to make the connection, which would be quite the aha moment. I couldn't just imagine like, wait a second. <laughs> Mary's the virgin prophesied in Isaiah that I'm going to marry? I mean, I could... I'd be like, whoa. But that's the, <laughs> that's the power of God's word. It can change your whole outlook on life. Amen? Amen? It goes for both the written word and the spoken word of the Lord. And the story goes on that Mary and Joseph needed to go to Bethlehem. 
And of course, as you know the story, there's no place for them to stay, right? Um, so let's jump back to Luke. Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. It says, And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, that she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So the next word I want to look at, the next thing I want to look at is probably what I feel is one of the most overlooked yet amazing angelic visits and rhema words given in the Christmas story. And I think we kind of zip through this without really realizing how profound this is. And this is found in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. This has to do with the shepherds. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And um, behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I give you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. For there is born to you this day in, in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And all of a sudden, it says, suddenly there was the, with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the, God in the highest and on peace, I'm sorry, and on earth, good, on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So I used to wonder for a long time, why did he say this will be a sign to you? Why, why didn't he just say, um, just go ahead, you're going to find, wait, the thing to look for is, you know, find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and but why is this assigned to them? And, and, and why did he say this to the shepherds? Well, something you need to understand about the prophetic or rhema word or, or whatever. Sometimes it may mean something that only the person is given to or to those is given to. Um, and that's, that's why a lot of times when I give a prophetic word, I'll, I, sometimes it doesn't make any sense to me. And I'll be like, does that make any sense to you? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, that totally resonates, totally makes sense. Um, and that's the case here because, okay, so in Micah chapter 5, I'm not going to go to the passage to save time, but it talks about Bethlehem being the prophetic place where Jesus was to be born. And if you back up a little bit, it talks about in Micah chapter 4 about a tower of a flock. And if you do your research on that flock, it's, it's about a special flock. So the, the point is, this is not just some ordinary flock of sheep, and this is not some ordinary shepherds. What you need to understand is, this is very likely... Um, the, the flock of, of sheep that were oftentimes set aside for Passover. And these shepherds have been trained by the priests. So they understand Passover very well. And the thing that they had to be trained for is um, they wanted these, she these sheep to be unbruised and uncut. So a lot of times when a, ba when a lamb is born, it will thrash around. And so what the shepherds that are trained to do, what they need to do is they need to wrap it up in swaddling clothes and place it in hay so it doesn't hurt itself. So this is why they, more than anybody, would understand. And this will be a sign to you. You're to look for a babe, which is the Messiah, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. So they understood that. I'm sure they wondered like, what in the world? Why would a baby be in, a, in swaddling clothes lying in hay in a manger? Um, but they understood that this was very symbolic to them. So at first this may sound crazy, um, but this is what they were doing all the time. <clears throat> um, and then after giving this word, it's like the sky fills with the heavenly host praising God. And to me, that if you're ever watching a movie of... of I guess the Christmas story, I think this should demand one of the most cool special effects. effects. You know, I just imagine like the sky filled with the heavenly host. Because I just, I would love to have been there to see what that looks like. That'd be so cool. All right, but continue on. It says, so it was that the angel had gone away from them in heaven. And the shepherds said to one, one another, let us go to Bethlehem. And this is probably, the, this, they, they estimate probably their flock was probably about a mile out of Beth, away from Bethlehem. And um, let's go see this thing. That was made known to us, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. So they explained what was told to them um, to everybody. But what was their response when the angels told them all this? This is interesting. Their response was, 
let's go check this out. I mean, that would have been my response, right? I mean, they actually, the angel encouraged them. He's like, this is what you're assigned to you, and this is what, you know, you will, you will find, kind of like they, the angel already knows, I'm going to give you this sign and you're going to go. And this is, what you're, this is going to be a symbol to you. This is what you're going to find. So sometimes the rhema word is meant as a call to action. And in this case, it was a very clear call to action. And they find Mary and Joseph and they tell him their whole experience. In verse 18, it says, And those who heard it marveled at those things which were told by the shepherds. And I'm, I would think that the shepherds would tell them the whole symbolism of it all, too. And Mary, it says, it says in verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary kept them in her heart. Sometimes it's good to keep record. I have a file of testimonies that I, do, I keep whenever I have significant testimony. I start out with any testimony. I pray for somebody you know, with a headache and I get healed, I'd write it down. I'd put it in the file. <laughs> Nowadays, it's not like every little thing I see, but definitely anytime I see something, I can put it in this file because why? I want to be able to go back to that and remind me of things I've seen happen. Remind me of the things that God has done because it says in Revelation, right? It says that um, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the power of prophecy. The testimony is being something that was already done. Prophecy is something he's going to do again. So if you've seen it done, you can expect it to happen again. And so a file, I would encourage you, you know, do a journal, do whatever. Whenever you, you have something like that, put it together and, and you can have that build, the thing that builds your faith. Not just for what you've seen, but also you've seen things that when God has moved, you can expect him even to do other things. I also have a binder that I keep of every prophetic word that I've gotten. Well, there's some that I still even put in there, but... I don't want to be a liar, but a lot of prophetic words I've gotten, you know, and even some dreams, um, you know, some things I've heard from the Lord, Lord directly, but I'll occasionally pull that out as well to look through it and read it and just to encourage myself because sometimes you just need a word of encouragement, right? It's like, Lord, where are you? What's going on? You need some direction. Look back at what some of the words maybe that you've gotten and occasionally I'll pray into them, which is also very important. When you're given a word, don't just be like, well, that was encouraging, and then forget it the next day. No, minister, I mean, um, you know, use that word. Um, <clears throat> pray into that word. I'm trying to think of, never mind, I was trying to think of a certain word, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, meditate, or steward, yes, thank you. Steward that word. Um, Luke 2.20, then the shepherds return, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it was told them. So their assignment really is the same assignment that it should be for all of us because we've all seen God do some great things. I mean, if you're saved, that's one of the greatest testimonies you can give, period, is your transformed life, Amen. right? Their assignment, glorify and praise God. That is our assignment too, glorify and praise God. For what? For all that we have seen, for all that we have heard and have been told. They glorified and praised God. But, you know, once again, it wasn't about them. It's always about pointing back to Jesus and how amazing he is. I mean, when you have testimonies, you know, sometimes when I would pray for something and I would see something happen, the enemy will come in and say, you don't want to share that because you just look prideful. Well, that's dumb because it's not about me. It's about yeah, I just happen to be used by God. It's all about God. Don't let the enemy steal that ability of you sharing a testimony of, of God using you or something you've seen. Amen. It's all about pointing to him. Yes. He's the one. The and it, it, it gives him glory when you do that. And I never want to lose my amazement when I see a miracle happen. I never want to lose my amazement when I read the Christmas story. It can start to be like, oh, I've heard it like, you know, every year of my life, you know. And maybe even more, because you've heard it multiple times in, in each year. But don't ever let it lose its amazingness. It's such an amazing story. And don't ever let you, don't, I don't ever want to lose my amazement of God in all that he does. Amen. Amen. Let's go back to John the Baptist for a minute, because I love, there's, he's such an interesting character. Um, filled from the Holy Spirit at birth, you know, when, in fact, it even talks about when Elizabeth um, I don't know if you remember reading this, where Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, and it says that the baby jumped within her. Like, that's just so cool, you know? 
Um, <clears throat> but the power and anointing was on Elijah. I mean, uh, the power and anointing of Elijah was on John the Baptist. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit from, from even before he was even born, even in the mother's womb. And did you know that he was actually considered the greatest of all the old covenant prophets? What do I mean by that? If you look at Matthew 11, 11, this is what Jesus says about John the Baptist. He says, Assuredly, I say to you who among those born of women, there has not been one risen or not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But this next part of the sentence is the one that will really get you. But he who is the least in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven, is greater than he. Least in the kingdom is greater than him. Who is that? That's all of us. Who, if you have Christ as your savior, you have, you have the kingdom within you. You, doesn't matter who is greater or who is the least. We're all greater than John the Baptist? That's just crazy. Uh, um, let's look at how the Passion Translation puts it. He's, they say, I'm just going to read the second part of the verse, yet the least of those who now experience heaven's kingdom realm will become even greater than he. This is really a tough verse to accept, but we need to do that humbly. Yes. We need to do that humbly because, once again, it's all about God's grace. It's all about God's grace. And um, it will change your view and, and properly give you the proper paradigm of the Christian life and your Christian life. Because if you're a Christian, you're not called to a mediocre life. You're not called to the natural life. You're called to the supernatural life. You're called to something great. You may not feel like it, but you're called to greatness. Now, I've talked about two supernatural births. We talked about the John the Baptist, and we've talked about Jesus. But John, the book of John talks about another one. Right? John 1.12 says what? But as many have received him, he gave him the right, which is actually, you'll find the, the Greek, the Greek word used for authority, to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Jesus has this long discussion actually in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus about being born again. Um, and he's trying to explain to him a super, that supernatural birth. In John 3, 3, Jesus answers and says to Nicodemus, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, to be born again, you need to be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus goes on to explain that this is not being born again to him because Nicodemus doesn't quite get it, but this is a spiritual birth. And birth is about what? Birth is about new life, right? It's about identity. You have a new life. You have a new identity. You're a new creature according to what was in, I think it's 2nd or 1st Corinthians. 1st Corinthians? 2nd Corinthians? I always get those two mixed up. But yeah, it says, behold, when you become saved, you're a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. Everything is new. It's complete like do-over. I love to tell people this in jail because so many of them love to do their life over. They're like, you want the ultimate do-over? Get saved. Yes. <laughs> All right. See, Christianity is all about new creation. It's all about birth and new identity. See, religion is about trying to form your identity. It's about trying to do works and stuff to try and form who you are. But that's not Christianity because Christianity doesn't come about what you have done. It's all about what Christ has done Amen. and what he's doing in you. Yes, thank you. So as a Christian, your works always flow from out of who you are, out of your identity. It's not trying to form who you are. And that's why actually in Isaiah 52, 14, um, when this is actually spoken about Jesus, it says, um, just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was, visage was marred more than any other man in his form, more than any of the sons of men. Because this is actually talking about one of the effects of sin, which was on man's image. Man totally lost the original image. His vision was marred beyond, beyond any man. See, sin made man lose his original identity and image. But you have to understand that Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He took on every single effect of sin for us, which includes shame and pain um, and ultimately death, of course. Why? So that he did this so that we could have full life. And he said, I... I come so that you, the enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy, but I come that you give life and life abundantly. And that's what he did for us. He did all of that for us. 
And so I just want to end my message with that today because if there's by chance anybody here who has never made that decision, there's no greater decision, decision to make. Or if anyone's ever watching this online, there's no, decision, no greater decision to make than to receive Christ as your Savior and have that ultimate do-over, be born again. Amen. How do you do that? What's our part? Our part is very simple, and that is to realize that our, we have that need, right? We have a need because we have fallen short of, uh, short of God's perfect um, standard. We've all of sinned, it says, and fall short of the glory of God, fall short of that perfect standard. And the second thing is, once we realize our need, we need to repent. We need to change our way of thinking. There's a change in mind which will lead to a change in purpose and a change in action. And then invite Christ into your life because he'll empower you to, to walk that out. Invite, invite Christ into your life to give you that new life and to live a life that will then be honoring to him. And if any of you want to know more about that, I'd be happy and would love to talk to you more about that. I'll be making myself available over here. Uh, my wife, Risa, as well. And probably the prayer team, I'm sure, will be available, too, if you want to talk to any of us. So, all right. Well, thank you. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for taking on and humbling yourself as an example to take on the form of a man, first of all, and come and be born in the form of man so you could ultimately take on the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. So Lord, we thank you for making that way for us and we pray that we would never lose the amazement of the Christmas season and the reason behind it. And so Lord, we just pray that um, you would get all that you paid for because you paid for it, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.